Well, uh, we'll start now with a short presentation about our school and the program. Great. Okay, so we will be talking specifically about the PhD program for the biology of aging. Um, it's geared towards those that want to focus in one of these kind of four core areas. Um, the program is fully funded. Uh, we will go more into that in detail in the application process on Friday session at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. And um, I would like to introduce at this time our panel. I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Kelvin Davies. Kelvin is a professor of molecular biology and biochemistry, executive vice dean, dean of faculty and dean of research, James E. Barron chair of gerontology, director of the Ethel Percy Andrus Gerontology Center, and director of the USC Buck Biology of Aging PhD program. To name just some of his accolades, he is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, a fellow of the Gerontology Society of America, and a fellow for free radical biology and medicine. Some of his current research revolves around regulation of gene expression in oxidative stress, degradation of oxidivity, damaged proteins by the proteasome and the mitochondrial lime proteins, adaptive responses to oxidative stress, and the role of oxidative stress, diminished stress resistance, and defective adaptive homeostasis in the aging process. Um, everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Davies. Hello, everyone. Welcome to you. Great. So let's jump straight into some of our questions, um, specifically geared towards this program. Um, Kelvin, can you tell some of the students what the school's admission panel is really looking for in a PhD candidate? I can, but first, let me uh, move my head here. I'm not actually sitting in this place right now. I was last weekend, I'm a sailor. And this is the island of Catalina, which is about 30 miles off the coast of uh, Marina del Rey, a little, little less than that from Long Beach, very accessible. And in the, in the corner back here, you can't quite see it, but USC has a Wrigley Center, which is a marine biology center. And we actually do a lot of studies in collaboration with people in marine biology, working on aging of fish or aging of marine mammals. So I thought I'd lighten the load a little bit and start you off with that rather than the really heavy stuff. Um, so the question was, what, the, what is the uh, executive committee of the program looking for in, in candidates? We're looking for people who are really, really interested in doing research. This is very much an academic research degree. It's not a professional degree. Um, it's a degree for people who are planning on a career in research, either in academia or in industry or in, or in research institutes. Um, it's really very much, as I say, a research, a research degree. If you, if you have a burning passion to, to know more about the aging process, why, why people age, uh, what controls aging, uh, what are the mechanisms involved in aging? If that's what you're interested in finding out about and dedicating yourself to, then this may be a good place for you. Um, the committee, in addition, is obviously looking for good grades um, and your undergraduate degrees. We're looking for, um, it's especially helpful if you've done research as an undergraduate. So if you've gone through four or more years of undergraduate uh, college, got your bachelor's degree, and haven't been in a lab except for, um, uh, except, except for lab experiences, but not actual lab research in a, in a real research lab, then you don't know what you're getting into and we don't know whether you'll be suited to it. So um, especially people who've done two or three years of, of lab research within real research labs at their undergraduate colleges, they have a leg up right away. And also the people who are mentoring you in those labs you're working in, can write you good letters in terms of how, you, how well you've done an actual bench research. Um, most of the people in our program are doing wet lab research, in other words, experiments, biochemical and molecular biology actual experiments. Some few are more focused on bioinformatics, and that's probably a growing area, but, it, but it's a smaller part of the program. Doesn't mean you wouldn't look, be looked at very favorably, it just means that our, our focus mostly has been on wet lab biochemistry and molecular biology. So those are some of the things people are looking at. Uh, we bring 
everyone who looks good on paper or looks good to us on paper and recognize that that's a, a somewhat subjective decision, uh, we bring out for interviews. So we probably have uh, eight to 10 slots a year in the program that we offer to students. And we probably bring out uh, up to 30 students to look at those. And those are the people that have looked best to us uh, from the applicants that we've received. Great, thank you. So you're talking about bringing out 30 applicants to come to campus, um, visit campus, <coughs> and interact with the other faculty members of the program. What right, it's found... actually more than that, what we do. Since the program is a joint program, it's a USC degree, very much so, but it's a joint program between USC and the Buck Institute for, Bi uh, for Research in the Biology of Aging. And the Buck Institute is up in Novato, just north of San Francisco, Northern California. Um, a mere 400 miles away. We don't seem to find it a problem. We have lots of collaborations and interactions. And uh, we, now that we're all experts on Zoom, that distance seems even, even smaller than, than it ever was. Um, we interact a lot. People go back and forth a lot. And for the interview process, we bring people here. First, we fly you out your, your, your trip. We, we fly you out, um, have you stay here for a couple of nights. Uh, have you meet people on campus? Have you do a campus tour? Uh, have you uh, have, have presentations from all of the faculty in the program, tell you what their the individual research is about? And then we speak, take some time for you to meet with the, the faculty members you're most interested with, either one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. Um, then we take you to a nice restaurant that night, uh, go out for dinner and let everybody interact together in a more, in, in a less uh, organized setting, let's say. Next morning, we take you down to the beach and uh, have breakfast on the beach. And then we put you on a plane up to Northern California, where you spend a couple of days up at the Buck doing basically exactly the same thing. So we interview you in, in both places and both sets of faculty. And you really get to see what both places are like. And it's a great opportunity to not only meet some other uh, PhD candidates, but also a lot of the students are involved in the program as well, correct? That's right. I forgot we also have you meet with, with students in the program and also with postdocs um, who, are, who are also in, in training here at the school. That's great. So on that um, visitation, um, do you do any interviews with students and what are you kind of looking for in those interviews? Well, it's a two way street. You're interviewing us and we're interviewing you. So we want to see whether uh, we obviously thought there was something special about you on paper, which is why we invited you to come. Uh, you must have thought there was something interesting about us because you accepted the invitation. Um, and then we want to both see whether or not that's a good fit or not in real life. Um, sometimes you meet people and things click very well. There's, you're all going to end up, I'm jumping a little ahead, so I'll come back to it later, but you're all going to end up working in the lab of one particular mentor, one faculty member. And that's a five, pretty much a five year commitment, uh, four to five years. So it has to be a relationship that works not only professionally, but also socially. You're interacting with all the people in the lab. Um, there's, it, it, it's not just about the academics. This is a chunk of your life and you have to make sure that everything works for you as well. So it's a two way street of an interview, yeah. That's great. So during the application process, not only the interview matters, but the application matters. One component is your writing sample that you have to submit. What is right. the committee really looking for in that writing sample? And are they looking for published or unpublished work? Um, if you have published work, that's great. We don't require it, certainly. Uh, lots of people do not have anything published before they come here. But if you do, that's a leg up, no question about it. Um, if you, uh, of course, you know, you might have had a very minor part in that publication or you might have had a major part. So whoever was your mentor, that presumably was the, the uh, senior author on that paper, will be writing you a recommendation and they'll tell us whether you, whether you had a major part or a minor part or exactly what that part is. Actually, a number of re scientific journals these days are requiring that each author on a paper stipulate what role they played in, in, the, in that paper's development and in the research behind it and the writing of the paper and the revising of the paper, data analysis, the whole thing. So that's a, that's a growing trend. Um, uh, so I, I think, you know, you could say you, you don't need to have published anything, but it, it, it definitely would, would be a help. Great, thank you. And is there any sort of topic or... Um, oh, in the letter, sorry, I, I, diverged, I diverged from the path. Um, so is there any particular thing? No, we wanna, we wanna hear more about you. So anything you can, 
tell us that tells us more about you, more about what your goals in life are, what it, what it is you think you've done so far, but more importantly, probably why it is that you want to do this. What about, what about a research career excites you, invigorates you, um, makes you want to go through all the pain and suffering that we're going to put you through? Uh, no, we're not, but we might. Um, why, why would you want to get into this? We really want to know your opinion, what your views are, and some more about you as a person. Um, that, that's what we're actually looking for. Great, thank you. So moving on into some of the classes and the research of the program, can you describe what can students expect during classes and research while in the program? Yeah. Um, so in the first year, uh, you take a series of classes that are basically the foundational courses uh, in our program. So these are the Jero 600, 602 courses uh, that you'll find in the catalog. And the, these, co these core courses form the basis of what, of our understanding, at least at the moment, of where ger gerontology or the biology of aging is at the moment. Um, and so you take those classes, they're obviously at graduate level courses. They are graded. You need to do at least B level work in those classes as a requirement. And at the same time, and very importantly, you're doing lab rotations um, in different labs. So when, before you, if you're accepted in the program, uh, hopefully before you come, you pick a lab that you want to start out doing a rotation in. You can either in the first semester do two or three rotations. So if you do three, obviously they'll be shorter than if you do two, two longer ones. Um, and in the second semester, again, you do two or three rotations in different labs. Um, so that by the end of the first year, you will have been able to pick a lab that you'd like to work in and have found a mentor who's willing have you work in their lab. It's a two-way street, as I said. So a, occasionally somebody will really, really want to work in somebody's lab. A student will really want to work in a professor's lab, and the professor may already have two or three students and doesn't have the ability to take more. In that case, it may not be a, a perfect match. Even in that instance, however, if you go to work in somebody else's lab who's doing work that's related to the person you'd rather be with, um, well, as you start your career as a, as, a undergrad, as a graduate researcher, you can always start collaborations between those two labs. Most people are very happy to have collaborations going. So even if you're not working directly with one professor, you could be working indirectly by doing collaborative work between two labs. And a lot of that goes on. In fact, collaboration is very strongly encouraged. So the, as I said, the first year is made up of coursework, uh, seminars, which are very, very important. Um, and those lab rotations that enable you to pick a lab by the end of that first year. Um, we also uh, have come to seminars in that are broad-based gerontology. So one of the things you get by doing a biology, first of all, we're the only place, as far as I know, you can do a biology of aging PhD. But uh, in addition to that, if you went to a, a straightforward biochemistry department or a molecular biology department, as I did when I did my PhD, um, then you're gonna get a straightforward education in biochemistry and or molecular biology. If you come here to do, if you're really interested in biology of aging and you come here to do our degree, one of the things that you learn quickly about, about the aging field, the gerontology field, is that it's made up not just of biologists, but of people who are doing, studying sociology of aging, uh, psychology of aging, uh, demography of aging, uh, aging economics, uh, po aging policy, and all of those people get together at national meetings like the Gerontological Society of America, which are really important professional meetings. And so in our seminars, we expose all of our students and our faculty and our staff to talks from outside speakers and inside speakers um, on all aspects of gerontology. So you're not gonna just get an education. Obviously, most of what you're doing is biology of aging, but by the time you leave here, you'd have a really good understanding of all of those other areas of gerontology and where biology fits into all of that, which is really important because when you get out there one day and you're on your own and you're looking for a research grant, you'll be applying to the National Institute of Aging, part of the National Health Service, and NIA funds all of those other kinds of gerontological research. And more and more, people are collaborating across those lines. Um, one example is uh, Eileen Crimmins in our school, who's a demographer who studies factual uh, information about the age, about aging populations. 
but she's now working with most of our biologists incorporating actual samples that people are collecting in the field that then form part of her uh, demography studies. And there are lots of other examples of this going on uh, throughout, throughout our school. Psychologists who are, who are collaborating with biologists on brain scanning, for example. Um, lots of interesting things going on there. So more and more people are becoming uh, cross-disciplinary. Uh, and I think that you get a real leg up in the biology of aging field by having a, a more a broader based gerontological education or exposure that you'd get here that you wouldn't get elsewhere. Um, and after the end of that first year, you've picked a lab, you're now working in the lab that you picked, starting on your dissertation research. You first go through a qualifying exam that's all described in the handbook. Um, and then you do your, 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 pick your dissertation committee and start real work on your dissertation. And at that point, from year two onwards, um, you don't have to take many courses, but it depends what lab you're in. So for example, if you ended up in a, a neurobiological lab that's studying Alzheimer's, um, they might want you to take a couple of courses from in the biology department in neurobiology. If you were doing heavy duty chemistry, um, you might want to take some courses in the, in the chemistry department um, and on and on and on. And there are courses, if you got really interested in drug development, for example, for Parkinson's disease, um, you might want to take a course or two in the, in the School of Pharmacy that offers courses in, in drug development. So the, the courses you take in second year and beyond, in addition to doing your research, really would be aimed at, would be picked by you in conjunction with your mentor um, and, and aimed at giving you a, a stronger directed base in the areas that directly impinge on your dissertation research. Great, thank you. So you mentioned earlier that uh, students have to kind of pick a professor or a faculty member that they want to work with, and that faculty member also has to agree with them. Does that student need to pick or identify that faculty member on their application before they come to the program, or is that something that's malleable during right. the time? So what we, well, if, you, if you know that you really are dying to work with Professor X, and you have a real reason for it, Put that in your letter that describes what the letter you write to us that describes your interest. That's a great thing to do. It gives us a little more idea of what it is you want to do. If that isn't the case or it isn't the case then, and we send you an invitation to come for an interview, then we will ask you at that point to pick the, the three or so most interesting uh, research areas to, to you and the three or so most interesting professors in your mind. Um, to make sure that we'll have time while you're here for you to meet with those three people. Um, we we would want, wouldn't want you to come and, and know that you wanted to work with A, B, and C and find out that A, B, and C were all on vacation that week. Um, they shouldn't be, but you never know. And so we try to organize things to make sure that you get to meet the people you'd like to meet. So the more you tell us, um, the more useful we can be to you. Mm -hmm. Great. And also earlier you were saying that it's kind of multidisciplinary. You can bring in kind of other elements from say neuroscience or demography. Are there a particular group of bachelor's degrees that you're looking for from applicants? Uh, most people are gonna come in with back undergraduate degrees in biology, biochemistry, chemistry, uh, some even physics. Um, and we've had a couple of students who are really strongly involved in, in, in imaging uh, research. Uh, that involves quite a bit of physics and in developing new techniques. Uh, so they're, they're a whole different group. Uh, we have a student right now whose undergraduate degree was in bioinformatics, and she's actually working in a bioinformatics lab looking at, at aging from a bioinformatics point of view. So wide degree of, a wide range of degrees. Um, we do want you to have, you know, a, a good solid undergraduate science background. Um, you know, if you, if you come in with a, with a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature, that's great. Um, but I think you need to go on, you know, it's not impossible. Um, I have, my wife and I have, have a very good friend who did it, who was exactly that. She, she was a, a Bachelor of Arts in English Literature. I think she had a minor in uh, medieval something or other. And she decided she wanted to become a physician. So she went to, back to school, spent two years, took all the science courses and got, in, got her into med school as an, and as an MD. Um, you can certainly change course, but if you applied just with an arts background without the science backup, um, you, you wouldn't really be a candidate for this because you need that, that solid background to start. Great. So say students have a solid science background, 
they know what they want to pursue. Would you recommend reaching out to faculty members before applying to kind of show interest? Um, there's two ways to look at that. You can either say that shows great interest and enthusiasm, or you could end up being a pest. Um, and you don't want to be the latter. So I, I would say be careful about doing that. If, if, if you really, really know you're applying to this program because you want to work with, say, Sean Curran, um, then sure, if, if, that's, if, if, it's, if, if, if he's more interesting to you than the whole program is, and the reason you're applying to the program is you really want to work with him, that's perfectly fine. I don't have any objection to that, nor will other people be jealous. Um, so the, like, if that's the case, yes, get in touch with Sean. If you're interested in broadly in the biology of aging, and there are three or four professors you could be interested in working with, then I'd say maybe wait till you get invited to interview and then you meet with them and, and you can talk some more and find out much more at that point. Great. So say one of the professors that you want to work with is at the Buck Institute. Can you explain a little bit more how that joint program works? Right. Yeah, let me back up a little bit. I was worried about how, where to bring that in. So go back to the very beginning. You start out, um, at the moment, this year's students will actually start out semester one, the fall semester, up at the Buck. So they'll all be up at the Buck. They'll take classes up at the Buck. They'll do lab rotations up at the Buck. And they'll live up in Novato or somewhere nearby. Some people are living in San Francisco. Uh, it's not that far from Novato. You can certainly commute. Other people are living in other parts of, 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 of Northern California. Um, but people, live, you, you'll be living up there. Um, and you live up there for the semester, do your lab rotations, do your classwork, coursework. And then at the end of that semester, uh, you all move down to USC. And uh, up at the Buck, they give you help with finding places to live. Last year, a number of students, I think six of them, uh, found one house to live in together. And the people at the Buck will help you with finding accommodations. Here at USC, we'll make reservations so that those who want it can have on-campus housing. Um, we've done that for the last few years. So we'll, we'll book rooms. We'll ask you in advance um, at the time of, of when, we, when we go through admission. Uh, if you want to live on campus, if you do, we'll start booking those rooms. If you don't, we can give you help with finding off-campus housing or whatever you'd like. Um, it, uh, so you come back down here in the second semester if, this year and start doing your uh, rest of your first year coursework and your lab rotations down here. And then at the end of that first year, you've got, or towards the end, you've got that decision to make. Hopefully by the end of the spring semester, you've decided on a lab, either here or the buck. And it doesn't matter which one you pick, you can pick either, you're free to pick either. Um, and if it's at the buck, then you go back up to Northern California. If it's USC, then you stay down here. Um, and if, if you've not yet decided, if you've done all those rotations and things didn't seem to quite work, then we can always look at, and we do uh, allow a summer rotation as a sort of a fifth rotation or whatever number it might be um, to, to, to help you find a lab eventually, either here or up at the buck. And I don't think we've had a student so far who hasn't managed to find a lab at one of the institutions. It might not have been their first choice, might have been the second or even third. But as I say, even if that were the case, because other professors have too many students already, you can always still look at collaborations between the lab you're in and the lab you would have been your first choice. And that actually gives you a broader based experience and may give you more. And the more people you work with um, when you finish here and are looking for a postdoc, uh, the more people who can write letters of recommendation for you. So collaborate with anybody you can and uh, you get lots, lots more uh, out of it, I would say. Great. And you briefly mentioned something about the NIH and different kind of research and different grants. Can you explain what kind of current research that's going on that's relevant to the program and the current status? Uh, that was cute. Um, the research that's going on. Well, uh, I think to, to look at what kinds of research we're doing, your best bet, student, <laughs> we're all still laughing at that. Um, kinds of research that we're doing at the school and up at the Buck, by far your best option is to go to our website and go to the Buck website and look up each individual faculty member and you'll, you'll get a detailed view of what everybody's doing. I, I, I would spend two hours going through all of that here, which we don't have time for. 
and you're not interested in all of that. So we're doing, if it involves the biology of aging, I'd say we're doing it. Uh, we're doing everything from human research to mice, obviously, to rats, to worms, to flies, to a very interesting model called killifish, which, we, which is a much newer aging model. Um, and these are little tiny fish that um, live, the, the problem with a mouse, not for the mouse, but for the human researcher, is that the mouse lives for two or three years. So if you wanna do an aging study, you've gotta go two or three years till your mouse colony is aged to do a real aging study. Uh, if you wanna work with flies, then you're looking at a couple of weeks to a month, much, much better, but they're not vertebrates. If you go, if you want to be even faster, then you can do worms that live only for 10 days or so. And they're even faster, but again, so far from human beings. So there's now a vertebrate model, which is this killifish that actually only lives for a couple of months, which is workable. And so there's a lot of interest in that. We've developed the, the, the uh, system here. Um, and that's also nice. You have little, little uh, tanks of fish swimming around instead of smelly mice. And the, the fish only live for a couple of months and they're very accessible and they're a vertebrate. So they're much closer to us than, any, than, than a worm or a fly. Uh, so that's a big aging model that's, that we're doing a lot of work with. People are interested in everything from molecular mechanisms behind aging. Uh, in other words, what are the metabolic, uh, genetic influences on aging? What causes aging? What, what modifies aging? So a big part of our pro program is, is on basic biology of aging processes, aging metabolism. Another part of the program is on diseases of aging. Um, so big interest in, and, and strong group on Alzheimer's and other dementias, uh, people working on Parkinson's disease. Um, a lot of interest in, in diseases that, are, that increase with aging, such as diabetes, type 2 diabetes, uh, a lot of interest there in metabolic, metabolic causes of diabetes, uh, and not just causes, but also hopefully cures or treatments. Um, we now have a strong interest in, uh, in various aspects of immune responses and aging. And of course, right now with COVID, uh, that's, a, that's a big topic. One of our faculty members, Mark Vermolst, has actually developed a, a totally unique tool for looking at the rate of mutation of the, of the COVID-19 virus um, and is looking for hotspots, mutational hotspots within the virus and hoping to be able to find portions of the virus that never mutate. Um, what that would mean is if you can't find a, a viral mutation in that region of its, de of it, of its, of its um, uh, genome, then those mutations don't allow it, would not allow it to replicate so that, so that those forms of the virus die away, they disappear. And if you can find uh, portions of the genome that never mutate, those would really be the best spots, the best sites for, against which to develop a vaccine. Um, so there's a lot of hope there and a vaccine that wouldn't just last for one season, but hopefully would last for a long, long time. So there's a lot of interest there, a lot of hope. His work was just funded by the National Science Foundation um, and is uh, progressing very well. So a lot of interest in diseases uh, of all kinds of big, big cancer interest, Cancer increases with aging, and, and we don't know exactly why. Um, we'd like to know why, and we'd like to be able to figure out how to, how to slow that down or prevent it even. Um, so diseases of aging are, are also a big, a big area of interest. Great. And so with all this kind of research experience and different routes that students can take, um, what would you say most students end up pursuing after the program? Do they go into academia? Do they go into industry, postdoc? Yeah, I would say a lot of a lot of our students go into into academia. So, which means first doing a postdoc and then getting a faculty position, junior faculty position, and up the ladder. Uh, a number of them go into go into industry. Um, there are all kinds of jobs in industry for people looking to do research. Um, it's a different it's a different kind of environment. You're less free. On the other hand, you have more more job security at the beginning. So, different people about that. Um, I, uh, I'll tell you a little story. Um, we all have our biases. So at the beginning, I was totally biased for all of my students to go into academia. And uh, one of my first, in fact, my, no, my second graduate student, uh, when he finished his PhD, he, we had a, a postdoc set up for him at Harvard. And uh, down the corridor, uh, he, he, he found a, a girlfriend who he eventually married. 
Um, and she got a postdoc set up at Harvard. And two weeks before they were due to go, they both came to me and said, you know, we've decided we want to try industry. We've got an offer from a little startup company and we really want to see if it works out. And I was devastated. And I said, no, you really, you're throwing your careers away. This is a big mistake. Just shows you what I know. That little startup company they went to was called Amgen. Um, these two people were employees, I think number 15 and 16 at Amgen. Um, they could buy and sell all of us several times over now um, and did very well at that company and, and made some real progress and moved on to do other things afterwards. So uh, they both had incredibly terrific careers in, in different areas. So academia is not the only way to go. It's, it's what I know. It's what, what's been my life. So it's what I sort of favor. But uh, we certainly don't look down upon people who go into anymore, who go into industry and, and do very well there. So. Those are definite possibilities. Um, some people not from our program is quite young, so we don't have that many people who graduated and gone on to you know, multiple different things. But, but in general, people who've done PhDs in biochemistry, molecular biology, if they don't go into academia or industry, do go on to do really interesting different things. I've had people who've been um, uh, worked as advisors to, um, uh, so I'm trying to think of the right, the right words here advisors to, to businesses about what they should put their money into for, uh, for growth uh, in scientific, in scientific companies. Um, some have gone on, even, even working for banks, for example, or major financial corporations um, as scientific advisors as, as, to, as to what's worth investing in. Um, so something that far away from actual bench science is possible. Some people go into being science writers. Uh, some people go to work for the NIH. Um, you can work at the NIH actually doing bench research, or you can work at the NIH as a program officer running grants um, or organizing grant uh, reviews. Um, there are all kinds of jobs in government for, for scientists. Um, so multiple possibilities and, and multiple kinds of grants out there for people who are working in, um, in, in academia, both from the National Science Foundation, um, the National Institutes of Health, which is the major one, and then all kinds of foundations uh, that, that, uh, that give money for, for research. Uh, and even the Department of Defense that funds things you would never think they, they, they fund. But they, they, fund uh, they fund things like um, uh, treatments for breast cancer, um, which you would not expect out of the Department of Defense, but that's where some of your defense taxpayer money goes. Wonderful. So some of those students are interested in doing academia or say doing different conferences while in the program. How does the program help them either prepare for grant writing or acceptance for magazines or journal acceptance? Yeah, so in terms of grant writing, um, one of the things we, we push very strongly is for students to apply for, we're jumping the gun a little bit on the funding, but we'll come, we'll come back to it. Um, we, we strongly uh, suggest that students apply for National Science Foundation or National Institutes of Health individual fellowships while they're here, starting in the second year. Um, the advantage to that is that you, don't, you wouldn't get necessarily more money, but when you finish your PhD, the fact that you've been an NSF or an NIH fellow is a leg up to getting an, a better job. It's a definite feather in your cap, and it's a good thing to have in your CV. It also makes the men, your mentor extremely happy because then they don't have to pay for you, and they can maybe take another student. So you make everybody happy by doing that and you also you help yourself. Um, let, let me back up one step and talk, we should talk about the regular funding before we go too much further on. Um, yes. So when you join the program, year one, you are paid for by the program. So your stipend is paid, uh, all fees are paid, uh, your health insurance is paid, and there's also a travel allowance to come back and forth between USC and the buck a couple of times um, that's paid also by, by the program. So. Everything is paid for and you get a stipend uh, as well. Uh, so there's nothing for you to pay and you're, you're paid. If, if for that, you are, you are required to be willing to work 20 hours a week uh, in your mentor's lab. Um, basically, nobody asks you to do that. They just ask you to do your research. So it doesn't actually come up. Um, but officially, that's it. Uh, in the starting, once you've picked a lab and, and your mentor has picked you, at that point in the second year, your mentor pays all of those things. So that's why it's important that, um, oh, that's right, that's why it could happen that a mentor might already have 
all of their money uh, assigned to other students and to other projects and not have any more money to take another student. Um, in that case, if you've got your own fellowship, uh, you could probably write your own ticket in that lab in any way, in any case, because uh, you come free for that person. Um, so that's, that's how the finances work. And, and you're paid for, we, we make sure that anybody who takes a student, any professor who takes a student, demonstrates that they have funding for at least three more years to support and agrees to support that student for at least three more years on the funding they can demonstrate. So you're, you're safe then, you already got year one, two, three, and four are covered, and we want people to finish in five. So we're just sort of taking a little bit of a risk that if at the end of year four, your mentor's funding ended and they didn't have any, anything else, the program would pay for you that last year. We wouldn't let you, we wouldn't let you go by the wayside. So in, in effect, we're guaranteeing you five years um, once you get in the program. So then the other question was, what about uh, conferences and grant writing? Um, definitely your mentor will encourage you to, and we will encourage you to apply for individual fellowships. But then of course your mentor is gonna be writing grants. And part of the training mentoring program uh, is that you get involved or they involve you in the writing of, of, of their grant proposals so that you get experience firsthand with a mentor in how a grant proposal is written, what the stages are, how you put it together, how you, how you organize it all. And so by the time you're done, you probably will have done two or three of those. Your mentor is doing most of it, but you're gonna be asked to put pieces together and you'll learn how the rest of it fits. Um, in terms of conferences, uh, we do a, a USC Buck conference every year, uh, rotating between the two, so you'll definitely be involved in that. And then any lab you're in is gonna want you to go to meetings um, uh, at least one a year, sometimes two. Some people do even more than that. It depends how productive you are in your research. So if you're churning stuff out and it's really hot, hot science, uh, your mentor is going to want you to go to meetings and present that stuff, uh, either as a poster or if you get lucky and you get picked to make an oral presentation. And that'll get paid for out of your mentor's research funds. So um, you wouldn't have to go to a meeting and, and pay for it yourself. In some cases, the school will pay or the Buck Institute will pay for students there to go to special meetings that they'd like them to go to. So there's a, there's a I would say students here to go to, go to several meetings throughout their, um, sometimes several meetings a year, but definitely several by the time they finish. Wonderful. And part of that is, is important that, you know, you, I, I always make sure that my students come with me to, to, to meetings. And part of being a good mentor is introducing students to other scientists from around the country and around the world. So that most of my students, and, and I'm not unique in this, everybody I know does the same thing. So by the time you've finished five years, you will have met several of the people whose research papers you're reading in the area of research that you're working on. Uh, you'll have met them face to face, you'll have some idea of who they are, and that helps tremendously later on in, in getting postdoctoral positions and other positions. So we, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a training process, and part of the job of the mentor is to put you out there and get you introduced to uh, people in the field. So would you say that students, by going to these different conferences with you, that's how you, not only you, but them can stay current on new research and different theories that are popping up? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, with all the tools that are available now through the internet, um, it, it's not exactly difficult to stay current on what's going on. I mean, every day, the, you're, you're being, the, the opposite is true. It's harder to avoid the stuff that you're less interested in. So it's really very easy to set up uh, on various internet services, uh, listings of areas of topics that you're interested in, keywords, whatever, that will then divert papers of interest directly to you every day. Um, and that's a very, very easy way to keep up. It used to be that we'd have to go to the library and you know, actually physically pick up the journals and read through the tables, every table of contents, uh, one by one before you found anything. And that took lots and lots of time, much quicker now. Great, wonderful. And I just received a question. How is the situation of the program changing with COVID and being on campus versus remote learning? Right, so undergraduate students uh, have been off campus. Uh, graduate students in research programs, we ramped research up to about 50% um, from what it was. And that's less than we'd like, ideally, but it's definitely going on. So what we're doing is having 
uh, shorter periods of time in the lab. We're having shift work basically going on. So people are going in in different shifts. Uh, people are working six feet apart or more. Um, and you may have, you, but all the graduate students in the program right now are continuing with their research, are going into labs. Nobody's being forced to, but so far everybody has wanted to. Um, we've got pretty tight rules and regulations about how it's done, as most universities that I'm aware of do. Uh, basically, there's a sign-in system where you have to request going into, into a certain building in a lab that day in a certain time. Um, and that's all part of been approved, pre-approved by your mentor's uh, research restart uh, plan. Uh, I'm actually on the University Restart Research Restart Committee, so I, I've been living and breathing this stuff for the last, last couple of months. It's driving me bananas, but there you are. Um, and then you actually literally sign into the building electronically. Uh, when you leave the building, you sign out electronically. You have to each day uh, fill out a form electronically that says that your health is good, that you're not, you're not having a fever, uh, you're not suffering from, you haven't been diagnosed with COVID, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And having done that, you can come in. Uh, we have all kinds of procedures in place for anybody who may uh, feel sick um, and uh, to be tested. And, and there's tremendous testing facilities on campus that are available to everybody. Um, and then uh, tracing processes. Although so far the cases that have come up have not been in research labs. Um, they've been students that were um, being less than careful, let's say, and mostly undergraduate. Wonderful. And is the COVID situation affecting the application process or the interview process for the next cycle? Um, we don't yet know. The, the honest answer is we don't yet know. So we're hoping that we'll be able to do regular interviews. Um, we may have to push those back. Um, it could be even that we'd have to do them uh, by, by Zoom, which I would hate. Um, but rather than doing none, we would do that. Um, so much is still just yet unknown. I mean, we, nobody really knows what the fall will bring and the spring is even, even less clear um, so far away. So if there's a, if there's a huge surge in, in viral cases, um, that would cause us to be much more careful. Um, I won't, don't want to go on an airplane right now. I wouldn't want to ask others to go on an airplane just yet. Whether that will be different in October, I'm not sure. Um, well, it, we, you know, we changed already quite a bit. I mean, for example, the university uh, fall semester was due to start um, a week later than we're now starting it, we're starting a week, a week early. Uh, we're dropping the mid-semester break that we usually ha we otherwise have. We're ending this sem fall semester at uh, Thanksgiving so that students don't go back to go back home, for example, for Thanksgiving, meet with all of their friends, and then bring COVID back to campus um, after Thanksgiving and before Christmas, thank you very much. So we'll end at Thanksgiving and that'll be it for this semester. No decision has yet been made as to what will happen in the spring semester. So that's all up in abeyance, we'll wait and see what's happening in fall. Um, but you're gonna get the same answer pretty much anywhere you apply. Uh, and if, if anywhere you are looking at says, oh, no problem, we have everybody on campus, we're working as usual, it's no big deal, don't apply there, because you might die there. No time uh, to be brave. No, definitely not. And can you, uh, as we wrap up on time, any students that have any questions, we are giving you the ability to unmute yourselves, and you're more than welcome to ask any question or submit it in the chat. In the meantime, Kelvin, can you kind of give some advice to any sort of applicants or people that want to apply? Um, advice. Yeah, really, really be sure that what you're interested in, as I say, is a, a career in research, a career in, in asking questions about the unknown, in contributing to human knowledge. That's what this is all about. Uh, whether you're contributing basic knowledge or whether you're contributing um, uh, new medical treatments or new medical approaches, still and all what you're looking at is, is research and is, is probing the unknown. Um, make sure that you're not looking for a career where everything is going to be laid out for you. Um, you know, this is, not, this is not for someone who likes accounting. Um, and nothing wrong with accounting. I have a good friend who's an accountant. But, you know, he knows exactly what he's going to be doing every day. And he follows procedures and follows rules and fills out forms. 
very good job. He makes a very good living. It's nothing like what I do, and it would drive me crazy. Probably what I do would drive him crazy because so much of it is organized by you yourself. You have to, you have to set out your own career. Nobody, nobody's going to tell you after you do your PhD. First of all, you do your PhD in an area that you're interested in, but quite a bit of it is organized or directed or guided by your mentor. Uh, your mentor has funds to do certain kinds of research. They can stray quite a bit from the straight and narrow, but they can't go you know, 180 degrees away from what their funding says. So you're going to be somewhat constrained. So that's why you want to make sure you're in a lab you like. Um, but once you're done with that, one of these days, if you, go to, if you go to get a faculty job at a university, somebody's going to say, what is it you want to work on? What are your goals for research? Um, what are your plans for the next five years? And you've got to start thinking about that. And nobody's going to write your research grants for you. If, if you go into industry, it's a little more organized because they'll say they, put, they want to put you in a program that's trying to develop a drug to treat whatever degrees, disease they're interested in. But even with that, they're looking for people who have ingenuity, people who have their own ideas, people who can come up with new ideas they haven't thought of. Uh, if they've thought of them all already, they only need lab technicians. So if, they, if they're going to hire somebody with a PhD, they're looking for more than just a good set of hands at the bench, although that's important, but they're looking for a brain that can help direct research too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So we have a question about um, the interviews that we were talking about earlier. Normally yeah. they happen in January, but with COVID are the number of interviews, the time frame that's kind of still all up in the air, correct? All up in the air. I don't think it'll affect the numbers. If we bring two or three people in, you know, we'll, bring th we'll bring the normal number. But um, because we have big enough rooms, we can keep everybody apart. But if, if the viral load is, is like it is now, I think we'd be putting it back. So we'll just see. And, and, and I suspect everybody will be doing that too. Great. And will that affect the number of applicants admitted into the program? No. Okay, wonderful. No reason to do that. So the, the number of applicants admitted is largely determined by the number of positions that we have funded. So we have a, uh, a what's called a T32, training grant from the National Institutes of Health, and I'm actually the, the, the principal investigator for it. And that funds a number of positions in the program. Um, so that, that enables us to, to, to bring first year students in. Uh, the school also puts money into that, and so does the Buck Institute. So as I say, we're, we're generally admitting eight to 10 students each year. That leaves us with a student body of somewhere around 40, 45 at any one time, given that eight or 10 are coming in and some are graduating. Um, and that's a pretty good number for, for, for a student body. It means you get plenty of interaction. Uh, it means you have other students with whom to, to, to compare notes and, and with whom to collaborate. Um, and uh, you're not out there on your own. On the other hand, it's not you know, 200 students that you'll never see or, or, or interact with. Wonderful. And I think we have time for one more question, which is kind of a more fun one. Kelvin, what are some of your thoughts on research coming out of the Sinclair Lab at Harvard? Ooh, I'm being, I'm being uh, recorded, so I'm, <laughs> I, I have no thoughts. Um, I think David is a, a very interesting character. He's very capable. Um, I, I was a junior faculty member at Harvard many years ago, and the, the environment is, is terrific. Not as good as USC, but, you know, it's pretty good. Um, and uh, David has done some very innovative work that has got a lot of attention. Great, thank you. My serious thoughts. <laughs> yes. So um, as our time has um, come to an end, I want to thank all of you for your time in joining us today and submitting your questions. They were really great questions. I want to thank Kelvin. Thank you for your time today um, and, and answering all these great questions. Um, I'm going to put my email in the chat one more time. So if you do have any other questions about the program, you're more than welcome to email me. Um, we will also be having a more in-depth conversation about the application process um, that will be held on Friday. Um, joys of you that are joining us for the PhD in gerontology program session, we will be ending this Zoom and we'll ask you to rejoin. So again, oh. thank you all for your time uh, and we greatly appreciate it. I'll also say that if there's a need or if people want to do more of this, I'll be more than happy to do another Zoom session at any time. So just let me know. Yes, thank you. Okay.
Thank Great. you all. Thank you all. Thanks for your interest in the program.